storm hits a small Illinois town in the middle of the night when one of its wealthiest couples is shot to death as they sleep. My parents were killed in bed. This was clearly almost like a massacre. It was a scene that will stick out in my mind and, and memory for as long as I'll live. Detectives soon learn this royal family isn't what it appears to be. They're kind of a dysfunctional family, actually. Will the storm hinder the investigation as detectives search for clues? There are reports of powerful thunder and lightning, heavy rain, and even some high winds. The weather is just so violent that all of that stuff would have been obliterated. Or will it end up helping catch a killer? The weather is definitely a factor in recovering sometimes key evidence. An hour north of Chicago, Illinois, and just five miles west of Lake Michigan, sits the affluent village of Libertyville Township. Libertyville, uh, actually my hometown, was referred to as a sleepy little town, a nice community to raise your family. The homes were upscale. Um, property values a little bit more, a lot of nice businesses, had a real hometown feel. It wouldn't be unusual for people to not lock their doors. I mean, there was just very little crime. The usual, you know, home burglaries occasionally, uh, probably some, some juvenile mischief, uh, things like that, but um, no um, very, very little violent crime, if any. In fact, here, the only thing that locals really concern themselves with is the weather. It's not just the snowstorms and the winter. The summers can be real scorchers. That hot, humid air makes it all the way to the north from the Gulf of Mexico, and that just fuels powerful thunderstorms, especially June through August. That's when the region can see half of its annual total. One such storm occurred in the first week of June 1980. On that night, there was probably one of the most violent thunderstorms, rainstorms that we'd seen in that area for quite a few years. But this storm would play a critical role in Libertyville's most infamous murder case. It's late at night when a severe thunderstorm approaches Libertyville. It started, I think it was around probably, you know, 10, 10 p.m. or so. This storm turned out to be significant. It came in from the west. It was a prolific lightning producer, and it also kicked up winds. At the same time, unleashed heavy rain. I mean, the sky just opened up and it broke loose. Lightning, thunder, wind blowing. It was very violent for a number of hours. As dawn breaks, the storm system has moved on, and the day is bright and sunny, but the tranquility doesn't last long. Somebody help, please. Yeah, this is Billy Ralph. My parents were killed in bed. We just noticed it. Where do you live? As paramedics and police race to the location, they immediately recognize the home. It belongs to one of the area's most prominent couples, 44-year-old Bruce and 38-year-old Darlene Rouse. Bruce Lee Rouse was born in 1936 in Mundelein, Illinois, just west of Libertyville. His family had deep roots in the area, going back to the 1880s. At one point, Bruce's father was a mayor. And um, yeah, they lived the American dream. I mean, they had the fancy cars. They had the beautiful home. They had the businesses going, um, a hefty bank account. So they didn't want for anything. They needed it. They went and they bought it. They were well known throughout the area. The Rouses were probably at, among the top families in town. In the late 1950s, Bruce met and married a beautiful girl from Libertyville named Darlene J. Stenlund. Like any young couple, they were in love. Bruce had ideas of becoming wealthy, and uh, he worked hard at that. 
Bruce bought a gas station in Libertyville, and in 1960, the couple welcomed a son, Kurt. Two more children soon followed, Robin in 1963, and a year later, little Billy. Meanwhile, Bruce's business flourished. Bruce owned several automotive repair shops, and gas stations throughout the Libertyville area. Uh, he also had an interest in a cable uh, television uh, network. Many, many real estate holdings throughout the area also. He had a gas station that was right in downtown Libertyville. Very successful business. Although his gas stations kept him busy, Bruce also had other pursuits. Bruce was an avid hunter, and he collected many, many rifles and uh, shotguns. He got along with people. He was just really respected as a businessman who worked hard and earned his money. His wife, Darlene, enjoyed the life of a socialite. Darlene never worked. She had um, her bridge clubs. She was active with the Chamber of Commerce and uh, different social groups, so that took up most of her time. In 1975, the family moved into a spacious 13-room colonial mansion in Libertyville, nestled along the Des Plaines River. Their home sat on eight acres. It was a, a massive house, indoor pool. They had a stable on their property, a um, couple horses for the kids. They had the finer things in life. There's no question about that. As the children grew up, Bruce and Darlene could afford the best for them. Kurt, the oldest boy, and Robin both went to private school called Lake Forest Academy, which is a very exclusive uh, school. Kurt was a guard on the football team. He was a runner-up state champion in wrestling through Lake Forest Academy. Robin was the apple of her dad's eye. There was no question that, that Bruce Ross in particular was really very doting on Robin. Billy, you know, was pretty young. I know he played soccer. There was never a want from any one of those kids. If they needed something, they had it. The Rouses were a well-respected uh, family in the community. But now, emergency and law enforcement are on the way to the Rouse house. When they arrive, 15-year-old Billy Rouse is in the kitchen with his sister, 16-year-old Robin. Robin was absolutely hysterical and she was pointing to the back of the house where the parents' bedroom was. Billy was talking on the house phone, and Kurt was nowhere to be seen at the time. In the master bedroom, an unimaginable scene awaits them. Someone had pulled the bed sheet up on the, up on the two parents. We did pull the sheet down. Right away, they can tell that Bruce and Darlene have been shot in the face. We saw the physical damage that had been to Darlene and Mr. Rouse um, and knew that immediately that there was nothing we could do. It was so horrific that I don't think anything like it had been seen before. After a wild summer thunderstorm encompasses the area, police are about to find themselves in the middle of a murder investigation like no other, where the storm could hold the key to a killer's identity. The storm was in the background of the whole thing. Libertyville, Illinois police have just discovered the bodies of 44-year-old Bruce Rouse and his 38-year-old wife, Darlene, shot to death in their beds after a torrential thunderstorm came through town the night before. These type of nighttime storms in the Midwest can be pretty common over the summer. The storms are driven by strengthening winds aloft, and that can feed off a lot of really warm, humid air that can sustain itself even through the nighttime hours. They're also known to produce a lot of wind and a lot of lightning. Homicide investigators from both Libertyville and Lake County Sheriff's Department arrived to the Rouse estate. In the kitchen, two of the Rouse children, Billy and his older sister Robin, appear in shock. 
They tell police their older brother, 20-year-old Kurt, is staying in a small house out back. After being escorted back to the main house, police break the news to Kurt. He was stunned. Robin was screaming. And uh, Billy was mildly detached. As deputies take the children outside for questioning, investigators examine the crime scene, and it's nothing short of gruesome. Mrs. Rouse had received a single gunshot blast to her head. It had literally removed from the top of the bridge of her nose all the way up in a Y pattern through her forehead. We know that it was an up-close shotgun blast easily within 24 inches or closer. It completely decapitated her, basically, and um, obviously from uh, that shot being fired, um, it caused quite a blood scene in the home. He had also received a gunshot blast to his lower mouth and chin area. And it blew the jaw away, a lot of his teeth. In addition to that gunshot wound, uh, he was bludgeoned in the head. We actually found some wood pieces from the butt of a gun still embedded in his head. But the killer didn't stop there. He was stabbed six times in the heart. So it was a gruesome crime scene. Was this personal or a home invasion gone bad? As police examine the rest of the home, it doesn't look like there had been a break-in. There was no indications inside of muddy footprints that anybody had come from outside, inside. No foreign hairs, no foreign substances, no fingerprints. But they do notice that some of Bruce's most valuable possessions are gone. Mr. Rouse was a hunter. He kept all of his guns upstairs in the Rouse home, in a closet. All of the rifles, all of the shotguns, there wasn't a gun left in that house, so we knew those were missing for sure. Detectives hope the Rouse children can shed some light on what might have occurred. Three different investigators attempted to interview the children separately. Billy, Kurt, uh, they didn't show a lot of emotion. Robin was pretty hysterical. But she manages to tell police about the previous night. Robin was at a dance at her school that night and she was with friends. And she arrived home right around midnight. When she pulled into the driveway, Billy was out in the driveway in just a pair of blue jeans, no shoes or socks, no shirt or nothing. She asked Billy what he was doing. She says Billy told her he was looking for matches in their father's car. So Robin went in the home, thinking nothing of it, and didn't uh, hear anything from that point on. In the morning, she says one of her father's employees called the house looking for him. When she went in to check on her parents, she could see that there was a lot of blood and her parents had been somehow killed. She went, she told Billy. Billy tells the investigators that he was out with friends the night before and got home around 10.30. He assumed his dad was already in bed. He says he was watching TV in the rec room on the second floor when his mother came home around 11.30 p.m. The master bedroom was on the first floor. Billy is on the second floor just above them. He says they spoke for about five minutes, and then she said she was going to bed. Billy says Robin came home when he went to get matches from his dad's car at some point. He said, Dad generally uh, left his keys in the ignition of the car. Then Billy says he came back in and fell asleep on the couch. Billy said I didn't hear anything because of there was a storm that night. Billy says the next thing he remembers is being awakened at 9 a.m. by his sister, who was hysterical after finding their parents' bodies. Billy looked at his parents and covered his mom and his dad up with a sheet and uh, called the sheriff's department. When detectives speak with Kurt, he doesn't seem to know much more about his parents' murders. Kurt said that he was with his girlfriend that night. Kurt says after his girlfriend left at 11 p.m., he fell asleep. He says he only woke up once during the night from the loud thunderstorm. Kurt had no indications, no knowledge as to what happened to his parents. 
none of the children have any idea who would have done this. But before the interviews can continue, they are suddenly cut short. Uh, uncle appeared and admonished the kids and told them, you're not talking to anybody till you talk to a lawyer. So that ended all questioning, period, of those children. As the bodies are removed for an autopsy, investigators turn their attention to the outside. As police scour the property, they realize the previous night's erratic weather might actually help their investigation. It was pretty obvious to me that car was taken from the scene during that rain sometime. In June 1980, the morning after a thunderstorm rolled through Libertyville, Illinois, Darlene and Bruce Rouse are found brutally murdered in their bed. Darlene had more or less almost had her head blown off. Bruce had been shot, then beaten and stabbed. This was clearly like a massacre, and in a place like Libertyville, really almost unheard of. All three Rouse children, Kurt, Robin, and Billy, tell police they didn't hear a thing all night because of the storm. The storm was severe enough the night before that that made sense, that somebody could have come in, shot the parents, robbed, or for whatever reason, left the house and left the crime scene without the kids awakening. After the children are whisked away by relatives to meet with their attorney, detectives spread around the exterior of the Rouse home. The police were looking for any type of evidence, whether it was uh, blood droplets or whether it was footwear impressions that might have been left in the grass, on a sidewalk, uh, in the gravel, in the dirt. Unfortunately, the weather from the previous night has worked against them. With the rain that was coming down, the way it was coming down, all of that stuff would have been obliterated. The weather was just so violent that it destroyed it. But when investigators examined Bruce's car, a few things catch their attention. The keys were not in the ignition where they usually are. They were placed in the visor of the vehicle and the wipers were in the full-on position. So it was obviously used during a rainstorm. To investigators, it's puzzling. That didn't really make sense with the timeline. Because when father got home from work, it wasn't raining. The weather was clear. Why would his windshield wipers have been used? Someone else must have driven the car sometime during the thunderstorm. Somebody got in that car and turned the wipers on and removed the keys from the ignition to above the visor. But why wouldn't they have taken a car that was right there for the taking? You would think if somebody was robbing the house, uh, you know, they would take the car. Investigators start to wonder if maybe the killer wasn't a strange robber. It would lead me to believe that somebody that's close to that family had access to that car and drove it and brought it back. But why? The vehicle is towed to be examined further as police canvass the area and speak with neighbors. But they all say the same thing. They said, we could not have told the difference between the constant lightning and thunder that was going on throughout the night versus a gunshot. As they wrap up the crime scene, Detectives head to the medical examiner's office, hoping for a lead. When the autopsies are performed on Bruce and Darlene Rouse, it's clear Darlene was shot first. They believe that Darlene died instantly, you know, shot at close range in the head. Bruce woke up at the noise. And then Bruce was shot in the face. When Bruce was shot, he was shot from the side. Whereas when Darlene was shot, it was like right into the bed. But that wound in itself would have not been enough to kill Bruce. If he would have received medical attention, he could have survived that. 
Then they believe he was hit in the head with the barrel of the shotgun. It was a very deep gash over the right eyebrow that actually caused a minor skull fracture. That also could have been treated, and Mr. Rouse could have survived that second wound. But the final injuries proved fatal. At the autopsy, they noted that there were six stab wounds directly into his heart. Each went into his heart. I think to an investigator might suggest a, a crime of rage. The pathologist estimates a time of death sometime in the early morning hours, which means all the children could have been home at the time. The children didn't hear anything because there was a storm that night. That was their explanation. At this point, the storm was probably still going strong. A heavy rain, it fell for the next hour, and it didn't stop for another half hour. Conditions finally calmed down again around 4.30 AM. With Bruce getting the most physical damage, Investigators wonder if he was the main target. The violence of the murder of, particularly of Bruce, where he was bludgeoned and stabbed, would have pointed more towards somebody who had a grudge. As the people of Libertyville start locking their doors, detectives look into several new leads. Perhaps this was a mafia hit. The general consensus of the town was that Kurt was the killer. Then, a key piece of evidence is discovered thanks to the weather. <music> Hours after a severe summer thunderstorm, the murdered bodies of businessman Bruce Rouse and his socialite wife Darlene are discovered by their kids. Locals in this quiet Chicago suburb of Libertyville are on edge. It racked the community, this respected family that lived in this uh, small, very friendly community, suddenly wiped from the face of the earth. It really created a lot of anxiety and a lot of disturbance. Part of the concern of the community was that, who did this? Why did they do it? Could other people be in harm's way? I mean, it really created a level of anxiety that you could imagine. It was one of those things that um, was very unfortunate. Um, Again, the basic reaction uh, were the people couldn't believe that it happened. They were appalled. They were scared. Obviously, they were wondering if there was a killer running loose in their area. So the tensions were real, real high at that time. As details of the murders spread, rumors swirl. That Mr. Rouse was involved with the mafia and that perhaps this was a mafia hit. Bruce might have been involved, you know, with the uh, gangsters, and uh, that the uh, cable TV endeavor that he was involved in might have been a catalyst for someone to do harm to him. I think that um, it was sort of normal for people to suspect that. That turned out to be absolute nonsense. There was a rumor that Mrs. Rouse had a very domineering personality and that maybe she had offended somebody who then wanted to come back and do harm to her or to her husband. That turned out to be nonsense as well. But again, just an indication of the types of rumors that can be generated when people have more questions than answers in their minds. There were suggestions in the community that this might be more of a family-related thing. Many people think it had to be one of the Rouse boys, specifically 20-year-old Kurt Rouse. Kurt had a very unusual look to him at the time. He had very long, flowing blonde hair that was kind of frizzed out. This was back in Charles Manson days. And Manson had that crazy look, the frizzed out hair. The general consensus of the town was that Kurt was the killer because of the way that Kurt looked and his actions and the friends that he hung around with. And when forensic results come back on the cars, investigators wonder if there's some truth to the rumors. There was nothing in the vehicles during subsequent searches that was of any evidentiary value to us. No foreign prints, no foreign hairs. Investigators know the killer had to be someone who had access to the house and cars with a lot of anger towards the Rouses. 
It was a lack of evidence that roused my suspicion more than anything. So it was pretty obvious to me that the focus was going to be on those children. Unfortunately, police are still having a tough time speaking to them until they get an unexpected call. Two months after the murders, detectives hear from Billy's aunt. Billy was now living with his aunt and his uncle. And the aunt called the lead detective in the case. And she said, you know, Billy wants to see if he could help give you some additional information that could help solve this thing. Detectives meet with the teenager, and he wants to look at some of the crime scene photos and discover more clues. Billy talked to the police and pointed out some things that were missing. Uh, namely, Darlene's purse. And he looked at another picture and he said, the dresser here, my mom's jewelry box is missing from that dresser. And he notes that the dressers have been pulled out. And he speculates that it looks like somebody might have been ransacking the dressers. Could their original theory be correct? Maybe this is a home invasion gone bad. Somebody was there to steal things of value, including a purse, money, jewelry, and the Rouses awoke during the course of this burglary, and then the killer turned weapons on them. So we knew that we had some items that were missing from the house other than the weapons. Although it still doesn't explain who drove Bruce's car and why it wasn't taken, which points to another theory. In my mind, somebody made this look like a burglary by taking those items. It was pretty obvious, at least it was to me, that there was no foreign intruder. It was at that point in October that there was a new development. Investigators finally catch a break when they get a call from a local surveyor. The man says he was out in the shallow waters of the Des Plaines River. The Des Plaines River fluctuates greatly depending on, on rainfall. After a higher than normal rainfall the previous month, October was actually drier than normal, and that means the water levels were pretty low. That's a hot time usually in a Chicagoland area there. So the water wasn't deep as it normally would be. It was shallow enough he could walk the river. He says that's when he stumbled upon something in the water. He saw what he thought was a pipe sticking up. When he pulled up this pipe, he discovered that it was a shotgun. So a call was made to our department. We responded to that area with our divers from our dive team and uh, continued to try to search the river. After searching the river for days, police make a huge discovery. A number of shotguns were recovered from that river, probably five miles from the home where the Rouses were killed. There were approximately 11 or 12 of them. And all of those guns had simply been thrown into the river. All the guns belonged to Bruce Rouse. We were able to find uh, Darlene Rouse's jewelry box, her wallet with her driver's license. There was still money in her wallet. None of her jewelry was taken. It was all there. If the person was actually stealing these things to, to get money, wouldn't they have taken the cash out of her wallet? Wouldn't they have possibly tried to use the credit cards? Unfortunately, the river's water has eliminated any forensic evidence. There was no evidence that was found on the weapons. There was no blood, fingerprints, anything that actually could have been found by forensic experts. But the discovery does prove one thing. It just uh, backed up my theory that this had to be somebody that set this thing up to look like a robbery. With no firm suspects, police circle back to the Rouse children. They were the only ones there the night their parents were viciously killed. And turns out, they are set to inherit a lot of money. An insurance payoff, I think the police could have looked at that as a motive. Mr. Rouse, you know, was, uh, had a very successful business. His estate was probably worth over $3 million. And then uh, aside from that, uh, he had a $900,000 insurance policy on him also. There was a lot of money to be gained by this. So 
couldn't rule that out. As investigators look deeper, they learned the millionaire family was anything but perfect. It was a family that had everything but had nothing. And the weather has a hand in another tragedy that will stall the investigation for more than a decade. In October 1980, thanks to the recent dry month, investigators have discovered evidence in the Des Plaines River from the murders of Bruce and Darlene Rouse that proves robbery was not the motive. Not only was it not a robbery, but it was somebody who was trying to make it look like a robbery. And with the Rouse children inheriting their parents' estate and life insurance, could money have been the motive? It doesn't take long for investigators to uncover some dark family secrets. They were kind of a dysfunctional family, actually. It was one of those types of families that just didn't get along. Robin appeared to have the best relationship with her parents. Robin, the daughter, um, was, was kind of more of a model student. The oldest, Kurt, however, had been on the outs with his parents for several years. Kurt was recognized more as a counterculture sort of character. Kurt started hanging around with peers that got into the drugs and uh, didn't get along with his parents at all. But shockingly, of the three children, 15-year-old Billy was most problematic for his parents. Billy had his problems with authority. Billy was uh, getting into trouble with the schools and doing some vandalism. Billy was responsible for uh, severely damaging three schools in the Libertyville area. The rest of Billy's education was in alternative schools. Billy was constantly yelled at by his parents or left to his own devices. Dad with the business, mom with her social events, so Billy started the old drug scene, uh, drinking, and this is at 15 years of age because they didn't pay attention to him. He was a troubled young man. Investigators start to narrow their focus. Even though people thought Kurt did it, the more we looked into it, and the more that we were able to definitely trace his activities and where he was at through friends and his girlfriend, that he was nowhere near that house. Robin had been at a school dance, and there was really no evidence that suggested she was involved. What does that leave? Billy, who lives in the house who has access to all of these things in the house, who's always being, you know, scolded for his behavior. Police want to follow up with the children, but are blocked at every turn. There was a grand jury that was obviously convened at the time, but all three of the children uh, took the Fifth Amendment and uh, would not testify. So the investigation kind of stalemated. They always had a lawyer. You could never talk to them. There was very little physical evidence that was allowing the police to go further. During the next two years, the children inherit proceeds from the Rouse estate and Bruce's life insurance. Anything that those kids wanted, all they had to do was call the lawyer and they got it. It's that simple. Kurt moves out west while Robin attends college in Wisconsin. Billy continues to live with relatives. More than a decade later, investigators get a surprising call from police in Florida about Billy Rouse. Billy, in 1984, he moves to Key West, Florida. I was keeping tabs on him through the Key West Police Department. Through the years, Billy's desire for self-indulgence only increased. It was a life of, of partying and drinking and smoking your way through a lot of money. Billy was spending probably around $20,000 a month on alcohol and drugs that he was feeding to his friends. Until all the money ran out. He hung around all the seedy buyers in Key West, Florida. He had no income. He had gone through every bit of his inheritance. It was gone. That's when he gets arrested. We got a telephone call from Key West that Billy had been a lookout in a bank robbery. 
With Billy in custody, investigators believe now is the time to make a move. There's not going to be any better opportunity than to try to go down and see if we can talk to this kid. So I rustled up a couple of our detectives that worked on the case, and we flew to Key West. Investigators sit down with Billy Rouse, and he says he's ready to tell them what happened to his parents that stormy night. To me, it's almost like a movie scene. The man has eaten me up 15 years. Family don't give a about my life right now. The murders of Bruce and Darlene Rouse have remained unsolved for 15 years and been made all the more mysterious by a nocturnal thunderstorm. The storm struck in the middle of the night, and that brought heavy rain, thunder, torrential rains, and those gusting winds. And destroyed much of the evidence. It was certainly plausible that shotgun fire could have been uh, covered by the thunderstorm. Any kind of adverse weather, it most certainly affects any kind of physical evidence that you can cover. But the weather did help investigators determine that it was a stage scene. Everything had simply been taken to create the illusion that this was a residential burglary gone bad. Detectives have theorized the killer may be the Rouse's youngest son, Billy. Now, 15 years later, investigators hope to talk to him. I just had a feeling that this has been eating at him for all these years. Investigators meet with the now 31-year-old as he sits in a Florida jail. I said, Bill, isn't it time to put those demons to rest? Shockingly, he agrees. Billy then gave his statement on, uh, on tape as to what had happened. According to Billy, on the night of June 5th, 1980, he came home after partying with friends. He says when he walks into the house, his mom is in the kitchen. She confronts him. She walks up and she says, he smells like liquor. I said, yeah, what about it? Okay. And then she says, yeah, don't worry about it. You're going to be shipped out to military school. I'm just over it. You're going to be just like your brother. You moron. He had the most deep-seated hatred for his mother. He said, all she does is rag at me all the time. After being admonished by his mother, he went up to the rec room, poured himself a glass of whiskey, and smoked the joint. That's when he decides enough's enough. I decided I was going to get rid of my mom. So he pulls out his dad's shotgun from the closet and started wiping it down and cleaning it while he's thinking about it. And. Um, decided that he was going to do this. He went into this kitchen, and he grabbed a knife out of the drawer. It's now after midnight. There's a horrendous lightning storm going on. There's nobody else in the house except Billy, his mom, and his dad. He went to his parents' bedroom and watched them sleep for a moment. OK, go ahead. So what did you do then? So I walked in the room. Took the 16 guys, put it up to her head, and, and the trigger went off. And I don't remember calling it, but the trigger went off. I don't know whether you would call that like a defense mechanism, or you can't bring yourself to say, I killed my mother. So you say the gun went off. Then what did you do then? Well, my dad sat up real quick, looked at me, and the trigger went off again. He said his father falls back on the bed, and he starts convulsing. Billy goes around to his dad's side of the bed now, and he takes the butt of the shotgun, and he hits his dad in the head as hard as he can. I don't know how many times I had my head completely. That didn't work. He was still. Okay. And I didn't, want him, I didn't want him in his ring. So I grabbed the knife, and I stabbed him until he quit moving. Although not planned, the storm actually worked in Billy's favor. If anybody would have heard it, it would have been Kurt because he wasn't that far away from the home. But with the violent weather that we had there, I mean, it was so loud. Any type of a shotgun or a gun going off, there's no way you could have heard it. Afterward, Billy says his mind was racing. I figured, man, I'm going to do this, man. I got to do something, man. I'm going to go to prison. 
Billy says he cleaned himself up and tosses his clothes in a garbage bag. I went back to their room. I don't figure I'd make it look like a robbery. He then takes the jewelry box. He takes the purse. He then pulls out the drawers to make them look like they're being ransacked. He then steals all the rifles and shotguns, and he thinks, I'm going to get rid of this stuff. After stashing them in the trunk of his dad's car, Billy is surprised by Robin when she comes home. What did you say? Well, so my brother came out to get some matches. When I was out of matches, I knew Dad had them in his car. After Robin went to bed, Billy says he drove to the river just as the heavens opened up. It was coming down his sheets. And he said, the winds were so high and the rain was blowing sideways, there was nobody on the road. And he said he had no concern whatsoever that anybody was going to be driving by and seeing him unload this stuff into the river. Billy says then he came home and went to bed. He says he doesn't regret killing his parents, but he's tired of living with it. The man has eaten me up 15 years. I don't really don't give a about my life right now. Look at the way I've lived. Billy Rouse is charged with two counts of first-degree murder and is extradited back to Illinois. In 1996, 16 years after the murders of his parents, he goes to trial. Despite his confession, Billy pleads not guilty. Of course, his defense was that the confession was coerced. It was not very believable. We all sat there and watched the videotape. The courtroom was fairly riveted. You could hear a pin drop. On August 10, 1996, Billy is sentenced to 80 years in prison and will be eligible for parole in the year 2035. He had to be sentenced under 1980s law. And the law at the time was that he could only get a maximum of 40 years on his mother's homicide and 40 years on his father's homicide. Although finally solved, the case of the Rouse murders continues to haunt the people of Libertyville. I think it's a lesson to us, to us all. I feel sorry for the Rouses. Any of us who have had kids know that it can be a rough, rough road. And to have it end in such a horrific manner is, is really a tragedy.